you're listening to Head On with your host, board-certified plastic surgeon, Dr. Baman Gairan, the pioneer of a life-changing surgery for permanently eliminating migraines and a specialist in plastic surgery of the face, head, and neck. When a patient calls my office to make an appointment to see me, we're going to need a month worth of a log that recording the duration, intensity, and also frequency of headaches. So when I look at, uh, and also they're going to complete uh, several forms for us. When they sit across me and I look at the forms, I have a really good idea where the headaches are coming from, what I'm going to do. But I actually confirm it. I spend at least half an hour with every patient, even after a review of all of the forms to go over everything that we're going to be, what I'm seeing, and make sure that what I'm reading is accurate. Most of the time it is. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes we change the plans. And the other thing that should be clear for those who are interested in having the surgery, they don't have to come to Cleveland to see me. We offer a virtual visit, and they come to Cleveland the day before surgery, and we make sure that our plans are accurate, confirm our plans, we make sure that we are on exactly the same page in terms of uh, trigger size, expectation, everything else, and then we go to the operating room the next day. And almost invariably, patients can go home the next day, whether I do no surgery or migraine surgery, they can travel the next day. And we, we give them all kind of precautions that they, they need to exercise. And the surgery is done almost invariably as an outpatient operation, unless the patient has such a BMI, the patient is so heavy that it is not safe to do the surgery in the outpatient surgery facility. It, it usually is done under general anesthesia if they are this more complex. But today, I would say more than half of the patients that I operate on, the operation is done under local anesthesia through a tiny incision for each trigger site where I remove the vessel, release a tiny nerve. And as I said, the patients can often go back to work the next day, the same day if they work. That type of surgery doesn't work for everybody. There are patients that have required two, two and a half hours surgery, rarely three hours surgery. When the forehead is involved, when the behind the eyes is involved, when the back of the head is involved, in the back of the head, if the pain is close to the ear, again, I can do that under local anesthesia. And I've done each of these procedures, I've done over a thousand of them. And and most of the time, it works. Now, our failures are usually related to inability to detect a trigger site. That is obviously, to a degree, my responsibility, and to a degree is the patient's responsibility to point me to the, in the right direction. What I tell the patients is that most of the time, I get what I want for the patients, but they need to be prepared that this could be a a phase, a process for the patient that we do trigger side, uh, surgery, the headaches go away in that, uh, in that side, but they may have other sites that we don't know about. And the reason is sometimes when you have intense pain on one side, can mask the headaches on the other side. And it, that we are going to know about that side only when the head, headaches in the intense side, more intense side, are eliminated. And the, again, the incisions are usually very small. Often the patients actually recover from the major part of the surgery within a week, meaning if we do the surgery in the forehead through an eyelid incision or forehead incision in the hairline, they can look socially presentable in about a week to 10 days. In the back, when we operate in the back of the head, socially, they're ready to do everything the next day because you, know, you can't see the incisions, but I, we limit their activities. Usually, I tell them not to participate in heavy sports, playing tennis, jogging, swimming, golf for three weeks, and not to take any aspirin 
aspirin type medications three weeks before a week after the surgery. Again, most of these limitations apply to the major operations. And even the major operations are outpatient again under light anesthesia and a very fast recovery. If the patients again are taking aspirin, Advil, Aleve, we tell them not to take those medications. They need to understand that the surgery is likely to work. There's a small chance that we may have to operate on other trigger sites and have mentally ready to be ready for the surgery not to work, which is extremely unlikely. If the patients stay with me, uh, there's a really good chance that I'm going to find a way to help them. I, I always have a plan A, plan B, plan D, plan C for every patient. The average age for a migraine patient is 44 where they can benefit from some other procedure. For example, they may have redundant eyelid skin that they they were considering to seek advice from a plastic surgeon. And that actually not only can be combined with what I'm going to do for their forehead migraine headaches, it can also facilitate the surgery because it would give me a little bit larger field. I remove the redundant skin so I can see the area a little bit better. Or if some patients are undergoing migraine surgery, they tell me, you know what, I have been considering nose operation to improve my nose for a long, long time. And this would be an opportunity while I'm recovering from the surgery. That would be a good choice. And I can tell you that that commonly happens. And some patients want a whole face rejuvenation. In fact, I had a lawyer from uh, Chicago came to Cleveland for migraine surgery. She actually wanted me to do a whole face rejuvenation. I did this for her, and I have followed her for several years, and she became totally migraine-free. So that combination, it really is gratifying in some ways because if the migraine headaches do not go away completely, at least they have some benefits otherwise. And whenever we do the surgery in the forehead, there is a definite side gain meaning even for the migraine headache surgery, we gain smoothness for the forehead. The 11s will go away, and they won't be able to frown to cause lines in between the eyebrows. And or uh, whenever we operate inside the nose for migraine headaches, most of the times the patients can breathe better than they used to. So there is always that side gain that helps me to feel good about patients that may not have complete elimination of migraine, but fortunately, that's rare. Most of the time, I get what the patient is what I'm after. When the migraine surgery patients tell me that their headaches are not gone completely, the first question that I ask them is, where do headaches start from? And commonly, again, it's a separate trigger site that we have operated, we have not operated on. So we operate it on this. Let's say that the headaches do not go away completely. And the question is, what type of pain they have? Some, sometimes they have pain from scar tissues. If that's the case, I may inject some fat in the area, their own fat that c- contains the stem cells. And the stem cells have the power to dissolve the scar tissue, reduce the inflammation. If that wouldn't work, there's a last resort, and that's uh, cutting the nerve. Have I ever done that? Yes, but it is extremely rare. Usually the other mechanisms that we have available uh, work for the patient or get the results that we want. But I can also add one other thing. Almost invariably, patients who do not have complete elimination of migraine headaches tell me and my colleagues that I've been doing this, this is something we discuss in panels, and we all are in agreement that they tell us, yeah, my headaches did not go away completely, but my headaches are responding to the medication a lot faster. My headaches are significantly less frequent and less intense. So that is the minimum that we get for almost everybody. Again, nothing works for everybody. But that, that is uh, a positive side that 
even the neurologist agreed to it. Anytime we do any surgery, there's always a potential for infection, excessive bleeding. Those are extremely unlikely after this type of surgery. There's going to be some numbness wherever we operate. That's part of the course. Gradually, the numbness goes away, and often the numbness goes away completely. There is occasional rare residual numbness. And when we operate on the forehead, there's a possibility for intense itching of the forehead. And we do have uh, means of controlling that, but that is not very common. Whenever we operate around the eyes, there's always potential for scar formation, which is called neuroma. Neuromas are scarring of the end of the nerves. And if that happens, sometimes the pain is extremely intense and uh, it's continuous. And if, if it happens, we take care of it. But fortunately, that's another thing that we discuss uh, during our national meetings, our uh, society meetings. In fact, this would be a good occasion to say that we actually have developed a society for migraine headaches for public and our colleagues. Public can go to the Migraine Society site and get the name of the doctors uh, who are doing this type of surgery in their area. And there are a lot of information for the public. And when we get together, we talk about these complications. And to the best of my knowledge, there are many incidences of neuromas, if there are any, actually. I, I, I don't recall anybody talking about neuromas after this type of surgery we do for the migraine headaches. Because we have means of measures of, again, preventing that. If we have to cut the nerve, we implant it in the muscle. That would reduce the potential for any kind of a scar formation at the end of the nerves. Anybody who has not been responding to medications properly cannot tolerate medications, has at least two severe migraine headaches that last several days and they're disabling. And for patients who have tried everything else and they have no choice, would be their candidates for us. But they don't, it doesn't have to go that way. Again, if the, the medications are not working, we are there to help them. And, and I think that, again, as I mentioned, there are many surgeons that uh, we have trained internationally who are doing this. This is being done in many countries, actually, now. Our studies on teenagers, actually, have demonstrated that the surgery can work for pediatric population. We have a way of knowing whether the migraine headaches and pediatric population is going to go away or is going to last. Because some patients have migraine headaches around teenage that goes away when they become an adult. But the family history is going to help us detecting whose headaches are going to stay, whose headaches are, not, are going to go away. Family members can tell us whether their headaches went away or not when they got the adulthood. Uh, so we operate on the patients only when their parents or siblings' headaches did not go away when they reached the adult age. They are actually very young kids that they can't go to school. They lose a lot of education. Uh, and I have had actually, to, even in early adulthood, uh, I have college students that they could not continue studying until we did the surgery. Then when they went back and uh, finished the school. One of the gratifying aspects of this surgery for me which is absolutely thrilling, is patients telling me that you don't understand. You, ch you have changed my life. And many of them also tell me uh, that they have control of their lives for the first time. Because many patients have migraine headaches. They don't know when the headaches are going to hit or come about. Even on their wedding night, they may have headaches or the wedding of their sisters, brothers. So they can make plans. They can make plans to be in uh, their children's events. So giving them that potential uh, to plan their lives is really very, 
very, very gratifying to me. There are rare occasions that I tell the patients, I don't think I'm going to be helping you. Those are patients who have been on heavy narcotic medications for a very, very, very long time. And I don't think that their expectations from the surgery is realistic, or I don't think that the patients are going to follow my instructions to help me to serve them. But that is extremely rare. That's a little bit more common on the nose surgery patients, but I don't deny helping patients with pain unless I'm absolutely convinced that I'm not going to be able to help this patient. On the other hand, also, I don't operate on anybody unless I'm convinced that I'm going to be able to have the patient. Unfortunately, many of the insurance companies consider this experimental, except for Medicare. Actually, Medicare covers some of the uh, procedures. And it is uh, hit and miss. I'm hoping one of these days our patients are going to get together and find a way, whether it's employing a lawyer or filing a class lawsuit or whatever, to get these insurance companies to cooperate. I feel bad for them, and uh, um, there are patients that cannot have the surgery because insurance doesn't cover any part of it, and there is also anesthesia facility cost that they have to pay for. So we try to help as many patients as possible. The price range is really very variable from one trigger size, two trigger size, three trigger size, five trigger size, and what needs to be done for the patient. So it can range from a couple of thousand to 15, 20,000 maximum for some patients, or it could be higher for somebody else, or depending on what the condition is. We do not have financing available through our uh, clinic for the patients who cannot afford doing migraine surgery, but we do work with companies that provide that kind of service to the patients, and Care Credit is one of them. Links to learn more about Dr. Gairon and anything else mentioned on this podcast are available in the show notes. Head On is a production of The Axis, T-H-E, AXIS.io